Good morning, folks. As we watch the last 24 hours on our star, please remember that tomorrow, Sunday, we will not be doing the news unless there is a solar emergency, because May 22 is when human calendars celebrate my daughter Kira's birthday. We've got updates on the new book PDF version at the end of this video, but let's get to space business. We've got the big sunspot group on the north. We've got smaller active regions all around, as well as filaments and dark coronal holes. The northern sunspot group is crackling and pushing top coronal fields, but we're not seeing any significant plasma pushed out into the solar wind. The most pronounced ejections are from ahead of the grouping and are being pushed to the right from this view, avoiding Earth-directed pathways. This setup is tremendously complex, but it's also immature compared to sunspot maximum, meaning we've still got a ways to climb up in the cycle. Meanwhile, still have to watch these spots as they begin departing, it's enough of the sun, let's go to the science. And we're going right to the center of the galaxy and looking in submillimeter to x-ray wavelengths to see everything our eyes cannot. Not in this animation, which is pretty cool, but in the actual data reading from the flaring core of the Milky Way. They've confirmed the 2019 significant, but far from catastrophic, increase in its flaring, and they say it's due to accreting material, which is a nice reinforcement of the general concept that when you dump material in, you get an exciting surge of activity, whether that's at a star or the core of a galaxy. We've been eyeing the upcoming European conference all week, and our final preview of next week's EGU General Assembly is for Greg Kopp's talk. You know, I'm not playing. I don't mean to be mean, but there's only one thing from him that I want to see. Acknowledgement that TSI, in every degree, has been keeping climate science out of reality. Let's go to Halloween, 2003. The greatest solar storms of the new millennium so far. I clearly remember bright orange aurora as a child one night visible from Pittsburgh. I wondered how the sky knew it was Halloween. Greg Kopp identifies the drop in TSI during that time is the most pronounced in the record, and he's right. That's also the problem, because with TSI, total, solar, irradiance, they don't have the proton flux, the solar wind, the interplanetary magnetic field, the geomagnetic and geoelectric forcing instantaneously to ground level and across all latitudes through the ionosphere using the global electric circuit and ground level enhancements with cosmic ray forebush decreases. It happened again in 2017, during the greatest solar storms of the last decade. This is a problem because this is what they use to determine how much the sun is forcing climate and it's ignoring the particle and magnetic field effects. They've got the data sets, but they don't apply them to the mechanisms discovered to be tied to them. TSI has forced them to look at the greatest solar events that surge energy into our planet as negative solar influence, as in, their data shows it going down in forcing. And guess where that shows up? In blame on CO2. They take the greatest solar events, erase them in the climate data, actually put them as a negative energy input from the sun, and then apply that blame to CO2 because there is no other tool in their toolbox. Don't let us down, Greg. Had a fun time reading this one. Not only good science, but nice reminders, including one about only half the visible stars in the sky, sun size and bigger, are binary. But wait, you say. I heard that many or even most were binary. Well, because there are far more brown and red dwarfs and other cooler types of stars we can't see with our eyes in the night sky than anything else in the galaxy, and those indeed are very often binaries. Plus, someone who knows the best approximation at log scale for stars our size and bigger going nova is in the four zeros realm. Bravissimo. Lastly, folks, we've got an awesome study on what I'm hoping eventually provides the clues to the last mysteries of the LLSVPs, the ultra-low velocity zones. Key one here beneath Hawaii, and it's one of the few deviations from the primary Pacific handlebar inside the Earth. Indeed, folks, Earth is not symmetrical about any axis, and it's not a concentric Russian nesting doll situation of homogeneous layers. This is expected to play an enormous role in the mantle heaving and crustal issues in the upcoming geomagnetic excursion, solar flash, and the next age of Earth. All related research like this, highly favored. As I said at the opening, I'm hoping to just be dad tomorrow. Kira is turning seven. Whoa. And the latest in the Kira and Lulu children's book series, Kira and Lulu and Noah Visit the Milky Way, is on sale at otf.cells.com. Another reminder that the platform Cells is closing its business on June 30th, thanks to Amazon. We have not finalized exactly where everything is heading next, so head over to otf.cells.com while we can. 
We are putting the PDF of the new supplement up, by the way, in the next day or two. So for those who have been super patient, thank you. It is coming. We greatly appreciate your support. We've got wind maps and shots of our star to close. Subscribe and we'll do this all again on Monday. Right here, but right now, it's 5.15 a.m. in the new Valley of the Sun. Eyes open. No fear. Be safe, everyone.